Right, afternoon everyone. Um, I will uh, try and uh, be lively and keep you awake because I know it's, uh, it's the graveyard shift just after lunch. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm an acoustic engineer or whether I'm an engineer who specialises in acoustics. I I'd like to think I'm probably the latter because I don't think anyone can afford to be any particular type of engineer these days. And uh, we'll talk a bit about that and uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I've made that claim. Um, that's a picture of a thermally activated classroom at North Birmingham Academy. Um, works really well. Um, it's a bit white out on there, but it does look really nice. And it works as well, which is good. So what I want us to talk about, I want us to talk about the role of the acoustician, because that's pretty fundamental. And I'd suggest that that's changed over the last 10, 15 years, for the better as well, I'd like to, uh, to, like to think. Talk about private schools as well, because we're all lunging into that. Um, for, for good or for bad at the moment and what challenges this gives us in terms of using thermally activated buildings. Talk about the baseline designs as Shane's already mentioned um, and uh, the involvement that we had in those and what lessons we learned from those as well and what, what hopefully that can teach us. And with that as a, a starter I want us to look at a couple of subjects. Daylighting is probably the most fundamental change under PSBP. Effectively, classrooms had to be redesigned completely to accommodate the new daylighting standards. So just to introduce uh, those of you who um, haven't seen anything of that, just what the differences are. And then thermal comfort as well, because thermal comfort is what we're talking about, isn't it? Thermally, activ thermally activated buildings. And then talk about fire and structural issues. And, and not these things for the sake of it or in isolation, but how they impact on acoustic performance and what synergies there are, what opportunities there are, to, um, uh, to double up with acoustic performance. And then the challenge to us all, which hopefully uh, we can take away and do something about. So the role of an acoustician. Um, some people will give more polite answers than another. Um, some people might think acousticians are the grim reapers who come and uh, add lots of cost to your projects. Um, I'd like to think that we add value to your projects. Um, but, it, but it's all dependent on when we brought on board. If we're brought on board late to fix a problem, then we're the Grim Reapers. Because to, to fix an acoustic problem costs a lot of money. But if you get us involved very early on, then we add value because we make the school better, or any building better, for that matter. Um, I was doing this at 11 o'clock at night last night, which is why these things have all come up at once, which kind of uh, steals my thunder, but um, that's my problem. Um, so the, the role of an acoustician is effectively to, to advise on sound. Uh, but not just sound in a theoretical point of view, because an acoustician, certainly in terms of buildings, is an engineer, not a scientist. And so any bit of physics that we try to impart, any bit of learning that we've come across, has got to be practical and it's got to be engineering. And quite recently, and uh, Shane mentioned earlier, Julian Treasure, and Julian's um, uh, been coining the phrase that uh, how architects only design with their eyes, which is a bad thing, and, and it is but it's no worse than acousticians who only design with their ears. Uh, we can't slate architects for saying, oh, this is a beautiful building and I don't care what it sounds like. If we're acousticians who go, I don't care what it looks like as long as it sounds good. Uh, th there's no room for either of those, just as there's no room for a structural engineer to, to build the most bombastic, solid building that will never fall down but looks absolutely awful and doesn't work as a, as a building. Uh, we can't afford to be that siloed. So acousticians need to appreciate architecture, they need to appreciate thermal comfort, they need to appreciate structural issues and fire issues. Uh, what we're not saying is that acousticians need to be able to design and take design responsibility for these things because that's not the case unless you're a fantastically wonderful acoustician who can do all of these things but I haven't met any of those yet who can do the, the whole um, gamut of everything. But we cannot ignore these other issues and so it's all about being practical and about not putting solutions forward that will never see the light of day because they're too expensive or they won't stand up or they, they look horrible or any of these things it's got to be integrated and I think that's that's the key word for certainly for PSBP but also for all design now it's got to be integrated and so what particular challenges do we have in PSBP well cost is a big issue when we compare with BSF, um, forgive me, uh, we, we always lapse into acronyms when we're talking in uh, education. Um, BSF 
typical cost per square metre of a classroom is about two and a half thousand, two thousand four hundred. Under PSBP, the government would like us to have eleven hundred. Now, to my simple maths, that's a just less than half. Okay, so normally you say, okay, you can have you can have something for half the money, but you can only have half of what you would have got in the first place. So keep that in your mind. Added to this. Um, contractors would like to have the same level of um, profit that they used to have but I think they're accepting now that they're, they're not going to get the same level of profit but one of the ways of doing that is by screwing the consultancy fees down and architects fees have been decimated uh, um, and so that's a big issue but also bearing in mind the latest and the biggest batch of um, B, uh, PSBP is PFI or PF2 and so you've got an extra chunk of, of the capex cost, of the gross cost, which is being cut off um, because that goes towards all the FM provisions. So for the sake of argument, we're, we're looking at one sample scheme which has a, um, a, a gross cost of about 14 million, but the actual capex cost is about nine and a half. So you, you've not got a lot of money to play with to build some great schools. So bearing in mind what we said, um, if you want, if you've got half the budget, by rights you should get half the school but no under PSBP we've got half the budget and we want better schools than we had in the first place you cannot deny the laws of physics but what we're, what we're saying is it, we've got to really challenge the way we do things forget the way we used to do things we used to be really inefficient we used to be greedy we used to we, we used to design in silos you can't do that anymore the only way to get the PSBPs to work at the budgets that you've got, or just a bit over because you're not going to be able to afford them at 1100 quid, is by everyone designing all together, by cutting out all waste, by being as lean as possible, and dare I suggest, by cutting out a lot of the architecture. There's a reason why the baseline designs are pictures of internal spaces because they're, they're about designing the buildings for the environmental criteria and you're designing the buildings inside out rather than the traditional way of designing outside in, drawing a concept and then trying to make the space inside work. You can't do that with the PSBPs, the money isn't there. Added to that, under BSF, when you were looking at BB93, you had the ability to use an alternative performance standard, which a lot of contractors took as a translation for derogation. But it's not. You never really could derogate from BB93, because you can't derogate from building rates. You can't say, I'm going to choose not to comply with Part L, because I don't want to. That's not good enough. You could put an alternative performance standard where you said, OK, this wall between classrooms should achieve 45 dB on site, but because, for operational reasons, the school wants to put a door in it, we, we accept that the, the level of attenuation is going to be lower. But it, it shouldn't stop there either. It should have been, it, it's going to be lower, and it's going to be lower by so much, and what that means in practice is that you're going to be able to hear people talking in a raised voice next door. And then the school says, yeah, I accept that because the value of that door gives me operationally outweighs the um, in um, insulation loss sign off. But the, the procedure for APS is now, under the PSBP and the, the son of BB93, whenever we want to call it, has been restricted. So we can only deviate from the new build criteria by about 5 dB. So we've got tougher criteria, half the cost, and we've got less ability to deviate from the regs. And now, uh, you look at the Academy's framework, which was heavily refurbishment, and the, there was a very weak clause in the in the, um, the scope of BB93 that Adrian and I must take some responsibility for because uh, it was it's our fault that it was there in the first place. Uh, effectively, contractors used to say, I I'm not going to apply BB93 to refurbishment. Actually, they were right because BB93 doesn't apply to refurbishment um, because Part E4 isn't invoked in refurbishment. It's only invoked in a material change of use. Um, but there's now specific criteria under the PSPP specs for refurbishment which are invoked as a contractual clause. When it goes out for consultation to um, be uh, replacement for, for section 1 of BB93 which is now, um, that, that will be changed to material change of use and there's a table in the document which says what, when does BB93 or when does 
Part E4 apply? When do SPRs, school premises regulations, apply, etc.? So we've got to design lean. There's no wastage. We've got to sweat the assets, which is like uh, people like to say that, don't they? And it's um, but it, but it's really true. Everything in a classroom has got to do at least one thing, and it's got to do it really well. If it doesn't do anything well, then it shouldn't be there, and it should be replaced by something that does. And so you find uh, building elements that do more than one thing. And the other interesting thing, as we were, we were talking about this over lunch is, as well, is that we're seeing now that um, under the PSBP bids, EFA are penalising contractors for going over Giffa. Now that, that's a coup, isn't it? Because uh, traditionally it was the case, oh, that you can give us more area, that's brilliant. But now if you give us more area, you're wasting stuff. Cut it out. So it's a whole new way of thinking. But the only way we can make this work is by all working together. If we don't work together, then it, the job doesn't work. And the design team isn't a team, it's just a load of prima donnas doing their own thing. Uh, and we can't do that anymore. So, just to uh, talk about the baseline designs. Depending on who you ask, uh, you could ask various people, what, what were the baseline designs for? Um, and depending on how cynical you are, it would depend what your answer was. But ultimately, it, it was to show that the new environmental criteria could work for the new budget. Um, it failed slightly because they were over budget. Bearing in mind that the baseline designs were costed at about Reba stage C. And when you cost anything at Reba stage C, you've got an inherent um, variation that you need to uh, apply. But also, there was a percentage over. You're looking about 3% for secondaries and 7% uh, for primaries. But they were pretty darn close, which was impressive. And uh, as Shane mentioned, Cundall were involved with the baseline designs. We were, we were appointed under the OGC framework to be advisors to EFA to, work, to look at the acoustics, daylighting, thermal comfort, fire and structures uh, of how to make an exemplar school or set of schools that could meet all these criteria. The, the other members of the team, uh, Faithful and Gould, were involved giving high level sustainability advice. Um, architecture, and I put this in inverted commas because it's not architecture in the true sense of the word in, in terms of um, the, the whole building solution, but Bond, Bryan and HLM um, were involved in designing the schools in terms of um, looking at the adjacencies, controlling the GIFA. But again, we, we talked how that there's no external views, there's no facades um, shown on the baseline design websites because that, that was not important. That's left up to the contractor. And then Anshin and Allen had, uh, I suppose, an executive role where they um, reviewed what was going on. And uh, the, the money was looked at by G&T and the client and the, the, the client team was EFA. So it was a, a very interesting process. But bear in mind, and this is a bit of a health warning, the, the baseline designs are only up to about Reba stage C or D. They're not fully developed designs. They're not something that you can just pick up and plonk on a site and it will work hey presto, because there are other things that need to be looked at, like the facade. But the, they were, do you remember back in the 1990s, there were a set of exemplar designs which were all lovely, but none of them met the building bulletins because they were developed by a, a parallel universe within um, DFES, as was at the time. They had one team working on the building bulletins and another team working on the exemplar designs, completely parallel with no contact in between. So the only thing that came out of the, that, those two sessions was the building bulletins. Uh, the, the exemplars kind of got lost because they didn't meet anything. But the idea was this time to converge uh, and it's no accident that a lot of the people involved in doing the baseline designs have also been involved in writing the, uh, the replacement to the building bulletins as well. So it makes sense to have it all in one place. But what we're seeing is, is what should be seen is that we're, um, a lot of the baseline designs are being used by um, the uh, technical advisors architects as the ITT stage schools um, for, for when the, uh, the, the PSBP schemes come out. But architecture and structural form are really there for the contractor to decide how they do it. And ultimately, everything is there for the contractor to decide how to do it. The EFA aren't saying, here's the baseline design, you build this. 
they're saying this is a means of uh, one way of complying if you want to do it another way great go and do it but bear in mind that a lot of the alternative ways of doing it were explored during the baseline design process and found not to work so there's a reason why we've ended up with the solutions that we have the other significant health warn warning is costs the baseline designs were based on a mythical site in the Midlands which was not too hot and not too cold using a Midlands weather file it wasn't noisy outside because nowhere in the Midlands is and there were no adverse ground conditions because nowhere in the Midlands has those so any practical site which has got um, radioactive waste underneath it and it's in the middle of a city and it's really noisy you will have a significant overspend but that there are abnormals budgets that go towards these but from what I'm hearing those abnormals budgets don't go towards the full cost of design for these abnormal schools so costs are a key issue so first of all daylighting the biggest fundamental change in the way that we're designing schools back in the days of BSF and everything that's gone past we worked at daylight factors and as long as you had a, 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 mean, a mean amount of light across a classroom then everything was hunky-dory the problem was what you ended up having was that the kid who was sat next to the window was blinded because there was so much um, light because the architect thought it was a fantastic idea to have a big curtain wall across the outside the kid back there couldn't see a thing because it was really dingy and then because the kid there was blinded you drew the blinds across you turned the lights on so you've actually got no daylighting you're using energy on your lights oh and by the way you're covering the windows so that your natural ventilation is not working so you have to turn the aircon on very very inefficient way of doing things so that's all changed and so climate based daylight modelling is the, the new way of doing things and it's fundamentally it's about providing a, a minimum as well as maximum amount of daylight and that daylight is based on um, an overcast sky which is generally what we tend to have but you've got to provide daylight across a space for the duration of the day with a minimum and a maximum value so you've got to control the daylight not just by pulling blinds across because that's not good enough it's not good enough just to get rid of the daylight when it gets too much but how that works in practice is generally you certainly for the secondary schools you need daylight from both sides because the, the rooms are relatively deep planned about 7.6 meters and you've got to control the sunlight as well and the control is by light shelves or external louvers or even, even internal light shelves and we'll look at that a bit later but one of the fundamental things is that the windows have got to be as high as possible right up to the underside of the soffit so the soffits were between 3 and 3.3 .3 meters windows right up to the underside of the soffit but also because we're controlling the amount of um, daylight that the windows tend to be tall but thin so generally about 30 or 35 percent of the overall facade is glazed whereas under BSF it was more like 40 or 50 or even more so to control that which also have a, has a knock-on benefit of reducing the solar gains so you reduce the internal temperatures and the overheating then it's all working together for good and so there's a lot of work being done at the moment by glazing systems and glazing manufacturers to come up with these light shelves and and various control ideas so this is, um, this is a section from one of the baseline designs so we've got very high floor to, ceiling, floor to soffit heights um, different responses to northern and southern exposure because the sun moves around in case you haven't noticed when it comes out but it also has an impact on the acoustic baffles because there's no point in having lovely big high windows and um, uh, lots of daylight coming through and then stuffing a load of acoustic absorption in front of it because that will get in the way so you have to coordinate the acoustic absorption so that it doesn't block out the daylight but also internal glazing glazing uh, if you looked at um if this was the, the 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 elevation between the classroom and the corridor what you'd see is uh, about the top 25 percent of that wall would be glazing and at each end you'd have a stonking great vent and these vents uh, as so similar kind of um, proportions to what Pedro was saying between 900 and 1200 mil deep but they're 1800 mil wide and 600 mil deep just to get the passive airflow through but also very high attenuation 
Um, also control of the, uh, because we're looking at getting as much daylight as we can back as far as we can into the classroom, we need to control the internal reflectance. And so we're looking at 70% of from the ceiling, 50% from the walls and 20% from the floor. Uh, they're relatively moderate values. E even down to the fact that the, at the top of the atrium we've got um, roof lights which then allow the, the light to come down and then e even the balustrading is, is, uh, is transparent to allow the daylight to permeate through so that you even get some useful light down at the ground floor even though it's three stories high. And again similar kind of cross section but through the uh, where you've got the, the, the big open, um, the big heart space, the big dining space in the middle. Similar kind of uh, situation with lots of roof lights at the top. The primary is slightly different because the rooms are slightly smaller, less deep plan um, and therefore you can just about get away with daylight from just one side. So what are the conflicts with acoustics? Well, straight away if you've got windows right to the underside of the soffit you can't have a ceiling. Forget thermal comfort, just thinking about daylight, ceilings are impractical. You could I suppose have a rake that goes up to it but again that wouldn't help you to get the daylight to the back of the classrooms. You need high reflectivity of any absorbent treatment so really you need, if you've got a suspended absorber you need it to be um, highly reflective on the back as well as the front. We, d we can't have obstructions because they're going to cause shadows uh, and also you've got the issue of, um, of sight lines. If you've got big high windows and, you, and all you can see through is a, a, a set of suspension wires and, and uh, absorbers it doesn't look very good so you've got to try and coordinate these things. But the opportunities to make really good coordination with acoustics is to look at this, this top side reflectance from the um, uh, of the absorbent baffles. So use the acoustic baffles to help get the daylight to the back of the classroom, making things work twice. And also looking at maybe combining, if we've got an internal light shelf, making that acoustically absorbent as well. So we've got additional acoustic absorption but from, again, from something that does something else. Well thermal comfort, which is sort of the, uh, the what we've been talking about today. Again the key principles for the, from the FSOS and the, the, day, the baseline designs are that schools are not temperature controlled in terms of there's no artificial cooling in there but there's also very demanding thermal comfort criteria and the only way that we've found to do this is by having cross ventilation with an exposed concrete soffit and with night purge cooling. You cannot use, uh, as Pedro has been saying, you cannot use um, the, the, the soffit for thermal comfort if you do not let it cool down once a day. And so you need controllability because you can't, you can't let um, nature take its course completely and, and just open the window and leave it and expect the, the climate to do the rest. These things need to be controllable so you have to have the, um, the, um, your external windows or openings on, on BMS controls which are controlled based on internal temperature and CO2. But also you need a manual override so that the teacher can close them or fling them open if they want. And just to make it even more difficult, um, whereas in the past you could get away with um, doing a wonderful uh, fluid dynamic model and doing all sorts of wonderful thermal modelling and you can make anything work on paper, but then it might not work on site, it's now got to be tested in use. So there's performance in use measures and potential non-availability under PFI, which makes everyone's um, speed dial for their insurers um, that, that bit closer to the top of the list. And so a lot of this came about because of um, the, 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 uh, the Sibsi Thermal Comfort uh, ta Overheating Task Force. And they were doing a lot of work in the same way that uh, we uh, in the BB93 committee have been, been working. But the key thing is that that's different to BB101 is that it's not just air temperature anymore. It's air temperature and radiant temperature. So you assess a classroom in terms of the, the, the radiancy of things like the building and the building um, occupants, which never really got taken into account under BB101. Also, to make things more difficult, we're using a design summer year rather than a test reference year. 
and you've got to comply with three, uh, two out of three of the key criteria. But what does it mean in practice? Well, again, this is a similar kind of thing to what we've been seeing today. You've got to have exposed concrete. Now, depending on who you ask, some people will say that, um, well, what about if you've got an in uh, a poured-in slab on, on a metal deck? Surely that's going to give the same kind of benefit. Well, we don't believe so. Um, one of the simple factors is that the emissivity of steel is a third of that of concrete. Uh, and, and it's all about direct radiance. Even though you've got a huge big gob of concrete sat on top of um, some steel, it's still the, the steel that the room sees, not the concrete. And so you do not get the same thermal radiance. One argument is, well, because generally if you're looking at a profile deck, it's got a greater surface area, fine, but has it got three times the surface area as a, as a flat slab? No, it hasn't. Um, by all accounts, if you had rusty steel, that has the same emissivity of concrete. But I don't think any architect worth his salt is really going to allow that. And I definitely don't want to sit below one of those. Um, but it's all about this thermal buffer. But the other key thing is, in this country, it doesn't get that hot, in case you haven't noticed. And um, so generally, it's only the 75 mil, the first 75 mil of concrete that ever does anything. Anything above that is purely there to help make the building stand up. Um, but it's only the, 70, the top 75 mil that needs to be um, cooled uh, and kept at a reasonable temperature. And so what does that mean in terms of the, the designs? Well, double-sided vent, you've got air coming in from the external facade. And then in the secondary schools, it goes through these vents at high level into the, um, into the corridor and then up through a thermal stack and out into the big wide world. Exposed soffits, which uh, certainly from the baseline designs, 40% of the floor area was given over to suspended absorbers. Any more than that, and you start um, having problems with your thermal mass and thermal radiance. The, the, the type and selection of the acoustic um, treatment had to be taken into account as well. We, we looked at using vertical baffles, but the problem with vertical baffles is that if you get them in the wrong plane, then they end up flapping around in the wind, which is no good. Um, and and also they're not as efficient acoustically uh, as uh, horizontal ones, which is why we ended up with what we ended up with. But because we've got air coming in across the classroom, there's a, there's a big acoustic ask for these vents that go into the, uh, into the corridors. They've got to really stop a lot of sound going through. But it's possible, the technology's there. Similarly, in the, in the um, primary classroom, we'll be, or, although because they're slightly small and we haven't got the, the need for the, getting the daylight down into the, the main core space, we, we've got chimneys. Um, which operate per classroom. The good thing there is you don't have the crosstalker problems that you would do in the secondaries where you're using the corridor as, as an extract plenum. Another benefit of using exposed thermal mass is you con you've got concrete roofs. Concrete roofs are great for rain noise because you can't hear it. It's fantastic. Um, that has an on cost though and that's a problem. Tra um, contractors don't like concrete roofs because they're expensive. And so we did look at using um, phase change material for the uh, with a light rate roof, but certainly we're not we're not fully confident that the the technology is there at the moment with phase changing materials to make it work as efficiently as concrete, and certainly that there's not as much confidence in the manufacturer's data either. But just uh, an interesting thing, um, and this is why you need to have good control of. Um, of your opening lights. This is a typical situation in a classroom in winter. You open a high level window just a tiny little bit and all of a sudden a big slug of cold air goes and dumps down on top of whoever's unlucky enough to be sat next to the window. And also, generally you'll have a TRV on a radiator so that confuses a TRV, then goes on to full and you have this horrible um, problem where the, the, the whole thermal um, situation in the room goes haywire. But if you use an internal light shelf which could also be used for acoustic control as well. It has a much better um, situation where it helps mix the, uh, the cold air as it comes in, which means that the, the overall mean temperature rises across uh, and is quite even across the class classroom compared with um, what we have there. So it's, again, making things do more than one job. So challenges um, for acoustics, well, exposed thermal soffit, 
which means we can't cover up as much as we might like to. We can't use suspended ceilings, um, which is a problem because of low frequency control, as we've talked about. Also, partition heads. Uh, partition heads in concrete, uh, where, where you've got a plasterboard partition and it goes up to the underside of concrete, unless that is a flat slab, which is really, really, really flat, you've got a problem with your deflection head in that you've got to take into account the camber of the slab. And so that, that's an issue that we need to overcome. Historically, the ceiling has been able to um, cover up that deflection head to give a bit of extra protection, but also will cover up any particularly ugly acoustic issues that go on uh, at the head. But whereas now everything's got to look really fantastic. We've got problems with external noise coming in. Pedro's been talking about that. We've also got problem with cross door to corridors. But again, it's the same kind of principles apply. But the opportunities that we've got are that we can, if it's done right, we can have brilliant designs. Things that work really well and look fantastic. It's prompted a lot of innovation in terms of ventilator design. Uh, and Pedro's shown us some, some great ways of doing these things, using convoluted bends and all sorts of things. Uh, and that thing is going to come much more to the, to the fore now. We, we still need to think about low frequency absorption. That, that's always going to be an issue because you can't get the same kind of low frequency absorption that you want for special needs kids from a, a, an inch thick wall panel than you would from a, a ceiling which has got 200 mil depth behind it. So we need to think about cost effective, robust ways of achieving that. And one of the, the other good things, as Adrian's been talking about, is that by shifting some of our acoustic absorption onto the walls, where historically with a ceiling we weren't able to have because there wasn't enough space below the, the ceiling, now there is no ceiling and we can put things on the wall at high level out of reach, that's helping to control flutter echoes. So it's all helping. Oh, what about fire? These bits aren't um, as much of an issue really, but just key things which we need to think about. In, in the secondary schools, they've got sprinklers because because of the, the natural ventilation and the, um, uh, the, and the daylighting, the, 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 the slots through the, the slab. Which means that when we've got the opening light at the top, that's also used for smoke ventilation. In the primary schools, they didn't need sprinklers, although a lot of insurers still say that you've got to have them. But it does mean that you need smoke and heat detectors. And you've got to think, well, where do they go? And that's why things like the multi-service beams um, are quite good, because you can have lighting, which has also got uh, maybe radiant panels, heat and smoke detection, sprinkler heads, all in one simple, really expensive, ridiculously heavy to lift and, and costly to replace option that goes down the middle of a, of a classroom. And also you've got fire and smoke dampers to think about. So when you've got these ventilators that go through to the corridor, they need fire and smoke dampers, which an extra cost and take up room. So what conflicts have we got? Well, these fire and smoke detectors need to go somewhere. Um, they're yeah, they're what, yet one more thing to dangle off the soffit. Sprinkler heads. Now sprinkler heads need to sit below the level of the, um, the acoustic baffles because they need to spray upwards as well as downwards. So that's an issue. How do we integrate it? And everything that we put in there has got to have fire resistant or fire retardant um, properties. But the opportunities are there for us in that um, fireproofing and acoustic proofing are normally one in the same thing. So covering up steels, treatment to steels, we, we, can, we can double up fire and acoustics. And also um, th th these treatment to the partition heads which are now left exposed need to perform an acoustic and a fire treatment. So it's a, it, we need to come up with very elegant ways of doing these. And structurally, um, the, it was structurally with the baseline designs, it's very much a sample of this is how they could be done, but the, it was very much left open. But the key drivers from EFA were that they were flexible and as flexible as possible. So generally these are the load bearing lines and everything else um, were there for, uh, for future if you wanted to move the walls, if ever they did. And so generally it was a 200 mil PCU with a 75 mil concrete topping, robust enough to, to cater for most um, vertical adjacencies apart from where you have something really noisy above or below something really quiet where you have to have um, additional measures. But also off-site fabrication was encouraged. So what that means in terms of the, the risks, well you've got these deflection heads which we've already talked about, Exposed steelwork, which is always a problem. You cannot leave exposed steelwork in a, in a noisy or a quiet space because it just acts as a telephone through to next door. 
Expansion gaps are the acoustician's worst nightmare because they're holes in the floor and the wall, which we need to look at. And also dynamic behaviour of slabs. It, it became quite popular under BSF to have first floor sports halls or dance studios above teaching rooms and you have floors that wobble. Um, big issue with acoustics because it's, it's a structural engineer's problem, not ours, honest. But the opportunities for us are that generally we've got really massive structures. Because we've got thermal mass, everything's concrete, you can get great sound attenuation out of concrete. And also off-site fabrication is fantastic because it ensures quality. It means that a lot of the workmanship issues that we traditionally find problems with, we don't have any more. So the challenge and the finishing is this, that, that we cannot exist in a vacuum. Um, we cannot exist in a silo and we need to be aware of the needs of other designers. Uh, we cannot waste, we have to be lean and the traditional role of an acoustician no longer applies. Acoustics is no longer a black art as if it ever was. It was just an acoustician's ruse to charge you more money. Um, and acoustics, if it's done at the right time, adds value. We, we can no longer be the, the, the perceived luxury or the tail end Charlies. That's not the role of an acoustician anymore. But what it does give us is fantastic opportunities to come up with some brilliant designs, excellent schools that meet and exceed the requirements that they're made for so that kids can learn properly and without being deafened or by, by being distracted. And it's there for us all to do. And that's a challenge to take away with you.